Okay, so apparently we are good to go now. So welcome uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Cowan. I'll be tonight's moderator for this PTGA uh, summit. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I'm going to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So first of all, the chat feature is enabled. So please make use of that during the summit and please let us know now where you're tuning in from and use it at any time to uh, just chat to each other. We also have a Q&A feature, so you can submit questions to the panel, and if we have time, we'll get through as many of those as we can. And you can actually upvote each other's questions and comment on them as well. Uh, there might be some polls that come up during the summit for you to vote on, and so that way we can get an idea of how we feel on a subject as a group, so look out for those. Uh, we expect to be going for approximately 90 minutes in this summit, and we understand some may wish to duck out early. Uh, that's fine. So just to let you know that this will be available online afterwards. This will be in the resources section of the PTGA website and also on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to start now uh, introducing some uh, all of our um, panelists. And I'm actually going to start with Graham Charles. He is a founder and current president of PTGA. And I'm going to invite him now to say a few words to kick us off. Thanks, Alex. Kia ora koutou, everybody. Uh, coming to you from Wanaka in New Zealand. Uh, good morning, Keitia. I also see Keitia uh, joining in from Wanaka. Uh, thanks, Alex and Lauren, for as always for driving these these uh, these programs in really important uh, important preseason sessions. And thanks to our panelists uh, for taking the time uh, from all over the world to join us as well. And of course, always to our best friend, Lisa Kelly at IATO for um, putting herself on the front line of, of PTGA. Just uh, a few things from PTGA. Um, I, I'm, I see many names here who are PTGA members. Uh, I do strongly encourage you if you are thinking about or, or going to be guiding uh, in the polar regions, north or south, to consider joining the professional guides association it's um there's a lot of there's a lot of good resources there's a lot to uh, there's a lot of benefit to joining the ptga besides just having uh some cool badges on your uh member portfolio which which give you a guide status and say what level of competencies you have um spend some time on our website but also if you are a member i really encourage you to get to know your tada portfolio and our member management system some of the, the the most regular emails we get at ptga are people who uh have forgotten passwords or logins um but there's there's and there's a lot of really good tools for you to use in there for your uh for your development because it's not just about carrying on or showing your competency awards but but being part of a professional association and and being part of a community of polar guides who want to make a statement about this being a profession and being professional. Uh, for this season, if you're looking for some development um, things, really encourage folks to look more deeply and consider thematic interpretation and uh, figuring out when you're doing your um, lecturing or just onshore talking with folks about how you can weave an engaging story into what you're seeing and what's going on in the landscape around you. So I know I know it, everybody says they know what thematic interpretation is, but um, I just really encourage you to do some digging if you're looking for some development this year to challenge yourself and see if you can get better at doing that. And I'll talk to you at the end. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Graham. Uh, the rest of the panelists will be relieved to know I'm not going to ask them to uh, speak themselves. Uh, but first of all, we have Lisa Kelly, who is representing IATO. Uh, Lisa is a longtime expedition leader, uh, also worked for the US Antarctic program and has for several years has been with IATO. So she'll be uh, representing them for us tonight. We also have Tom Hart coming to us, I think, from Oxford uh, in England, and he's our penguinologist and avian flu expert. Uh, we have uh, Will Abbott coming to us from Sydney, Australia. He is operations manager for Intrepid Expeditions, and he's going to be giving us the operator's point of view. 
And then we have um, two expedition leaders. First of all, we have Steffi Walker in Edinburgh, part of our Scottish Mafia, and also Ali Liddell, who many of you may know, a longtime expedition leader on the Isle of Skye. Uh, in the background, we have Lauren Farmer, another part of our Scottish Mafia, who's uh, in Loch Carron, Scotland, and she's going to be running the background tech and uh, checking on your questions and also running the polls and the Q&A. So that's enough from me. We're going to dive right into it now. So we're going to start uh, section one tonight. We'd like to talk about uh, all the things that as guides we need to know going into this season. So I'm going to ask Lisa now to tell us what are our must knows this season with the exception of avian flu. What are the things we need to know? What are the documents must we read before we go to sea? All right. Well, thank you and, and thanks to PTGA for having me and, and thank you to you all for joining tonight. Um, as Alex said, I'm Lisa Kelly and I'm the Director of Operations for IATO and, and part of that along with um, the rest of the IATO Secretariat and in particular my team in operations, Aaron, Stella and Jill, who are absolutely incredible. Um, it's our job to help you and support you as much as we possibly can in the field with materials or tools, such as the live ship scheduler. Um, we know that every year it is a lot of information for you to digest. Um, you know, you, you do amazing jobs taking the online assessments and looking at the materials. And I won't go into a huge amount of details about these um, particular uh documents that you should be looking at, um, but I'll give you a general overview. Um, and I will, in particular, I will leave out the biosecurity instructions because that will come later when Tom comes in to talk a bit more about um, avian influenza and the impact on the season. Um, so the big documents um, that you should be looking at that have just, just come out in the last few weeks are the operational instructions and the biosecurity instructions. Again, we'll talk about the biosecurity instructions later. The operational instructions, these come out around this time of year because we're waiting for the you know, most up-to-date information, uh, whether it be on um, station visits or medical evacuations, whatever, we wanna make sure that you have that at hand. And even then, um, those documents do get um, up updated even throughout the season. So we've already had an update, for instance, on station visits, I'll talk about in just a minute, um, in the last week. So really, um, the operational instructions, these are the, the must knows. If you just, you, everybody should read this from the office folks to the ship captains to all of the field staff, most certainly. And this talks about um, things that have changed, um, updated documents, and also those um, ever so important updates on, on site guidelines. So we do direct you it, within this document to other documentation within the IATO field operation manual. So I'll go over some of the, the, the changes that have happened this year, um, which Ted, uh, who is Ted Cheeseman, who's lurking in the background of uh, Tom's camera, he um, will be well familiar with this, uh, that we have had an update on the whale slowdown areas. Um, so we have, thanks to many of you participating in VCAPs last year from the right. ships, um, that's the voluntary um, cetacean and, and mammal um, reporting. Um, we have had updates on that and where the whales are, how early they're down at the peninsula. And because of that, at the annual meeting, it was agreed upon that there would be um, some new whale slowdown areas instated around the South Shetland Islands in particular, and also that we would bring forward the dates of the 10 knot slowdown. And that starts November 1st for that uh, upper part of the um, Antarctic Peninsula, uh, Crystal Sound area still stays as it stands. So it's important to note this for you as expedition leaders, especially when you're doing your planning on distances, because you now will be restricted even within the South Shetland Islands. Um, the coordinates and the areas are depicted 
in that documentation, which is in FOM section eight. So have a look at that. Um, the VCAPS program that helped to feed into this will continue this season as, long, as well as another monitoring program, which we'll be rolling out in the next few weeks. And the reason for these monitoring programs is because we really want to add, um, well, you know, bigger data sets um, to the Antarctic Treaty Party discussions. So all of this information eventually feeds into the Antarctic Treaty Parties. We as IATO, you as being in the field, we are doing a lot of things at a faster pace um, than the treaty parties necessarily can just due to their process. So any information we can feed in and make sure that accurate data is recorded is super important. And that goes with PVRs as well. Um, another document that has been updated are the code of conduct and the vessel helicopter procedures. Um, last year, we did have a couple of um, incidents where um, it was felt that helicopters were not in line with the intrinsic values of Antarctica and some other vessels felt um, a little bit uh, like they were being impinged on by any helicopter operations. So the helicopter working group has gone to some really great lengths to strengthen their own procedures. Um, one of the big parts of that is that they commit to not being seen or heard. Um, so that's them really taking in and paying attention to the areas in which they're flying, noting all the ships. Um, and then also um, they were, are going to trial some no-fly zones this season. Uh, we're just finishing up the, the document with the no-fly zones and that'll be a trial procedure. Um, but I do really encourage you to read those new um, updates in the code of conduct and the helicopter procedures um, that are really important for you this season. And we want feedback from you in the field, whether it be a good interaction with, a, with helicopters or a bad interaction, we want to know so that we can continue to strengthen our guidelines because they are um, really important, again, helicopters were almost completely banned on the treaty, treaty level this last uh, Antarctic Treaty meeting. So it's really important that we, again, are feeding this data into the system. We will also have 17 new site guidelines. Um, shameless plug for the IATO side of the, the webinars. Next, um, next Thursday, we'll have a webinar which will go over these new site guidelines. They are listed in the operational instructions. And these are based on um, your feedback from the field of needing some more information about sites, especially the newer expedition leaders, where you can go, a lot more detail. So we've, we've brought in actual um, expedition leaders out in the field. They've come in, they've written these guidelines, we've cleaned them up a bit, um, and then they're, they're going out for trial this season. So do have a look at those. Um, and some of them are, are actually marine sites uh, like Burton and also Sierra Cove. So um, those are some really big documents and a big thank you to the Field Operations Committee. Um, Port Lockroy also has some new updates to their documents for this season. Um, we just put that in the FOM as of Friday. Uh, that's when we received it. So it's in the FOM. And this season obviously will be challenging for them too within light of avian influenza. And they are going to have uh, more of a mobile shopping. Um, so bringing the shop out to the vessel, but you know, it, they continue to be a, a charity which relies very much on all of us to, to support them. So hopefully you can continue to support them in that way, but even just bringing them on for showers and fresh waters and a bottle of wine or gin now and then, of course. And um, lastly, uh, the last thing I really wanted to say is that with you all in the field, um, there's a lot going on. There always is. Um, please continue giving us that feedback. Honestly, um, especially the operations team, we're here to support you as much as we can during the season. We will be available seven days a week. We'll be checking all of those email inboxes um, starting at the end of October so that we can be there to support you. And of course, the IATO emergency line is available 24-7 um, now. And if you have 
doesn't have to be an incident, but if you have a suggestion or you see something happening in the field, please feed that back. It'll help the entire industry um, have a better and safer season. So thank you all very, very much for everything that you do out in the field. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Um, Lauren has um, written down which documents you mentioned there uh, that uh, all staff should review. Uh, would it be okay for us to upload that to the chat or would you prefer people access those through the form? Um, you can upload those docs to the chat. That's fine with me. Okay, yes. thanks. So Lauren will upload those now. That's great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, before we move on to the avian flu section, do any of our panelists have any uh, comments on uh, some of the new things this season? Excellent. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, the next big, big section, which is obviously the elephant in the room, which is avian flu and how this is going to affect us this season. Um, so first of all, Tom, maybe you could update us on the current situation in South America and the prospects of how and when avian flu might reach uh, the peninsula or South Georgia. Yeah, and I, I think I'd quite like to keep this very simple in that, um, obviously, this is a best guess and this is a risk assessment. Uh, this is available via a SCAR document, the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research, and a lot of different people have put into that document. Uh, so I'm really just representing a consensus, but avian flu is now found in penguins, boobies, a, a host of seabirds in South America. Um, it's also crossed into um, a number of seals. Um, so it's, it's in and affecting sister taxa to those found in Antarctica. So if you like, that's part one of the risk assessment in that we know it's, it hits taxa that are found in Antarctica and South Georgia. Um, then we considered some other risk factors and the main one was distance um, and, and how, how it might reach different areas. And the, the huge um, take home from that is, was that the Falklands is extremely exposed and we would expect the Falklands to be compromised or to be infected with avian flu very, very shortly. Um, there's so many migrant species going from South America to the Falklands now uh, that we expect that to reach there. Um, South Georgia came out as very high risk and the Antarctic Peninsula is slightly lower risk. So um, I think that speaks for itself. Where it has hit elsewhere, it really depends on the species. Not every colony of susceptible species has been hit. Um, I've been working quite a lot on gannets around the UK and the, um, the Palearctic. And yeah, not every colony gets hit, but those that do are showing 25 to 40% mortality consistently. Um, we've now had two seasons of that. So we're coming to the end of the second breeding season. And it wasn't as bad this year. And we're seeing a lot of, of previous non-breeders filling in for the populations. So um, I think I'll leave it there and take questions because um, truly we don't know. Uh, we don't know uh, until it happens. These are predictions based on, on the risks we've identified. Um, the other thing I would say is that it's not going to be our fault if it arrives there. These are spread by migratory animals. It is our fault if we spread it. That's the trouble. And that's really why everyone is scared and trying to be precautionary, is that we don't want to add to whatever it is. And if we can help, uh, not even mitigate, but if we can help slow any spread, that will give species we think that are going to be affected the best chance. That's great. Thank you, Tom. I actually had a couple of questions myself from watching the IATO webinar. 
Uh, someone mentioned that it's believed there are three individual events where um, avian flu entered North America. And if that's correct, do we know if that's wild birds or captive birds? And so, sorry, let me add to that question. And they also said it has not made it to Australasia yet. And so I guess what I'm getting at, like, is there any chance at all it might not make it to South Georgia or Antarctica? Um, the That's likely the, the input in, influx into North America. That is likely natural by wild, bird, wild birds. Um, the, the spread has almost certainly around the world been largely natural which is where it infects uh, migrant, um, particularly scavengers. Um, skewers, uh, giant petrels are likely to be two of the, the most affected species and the most likely to spread it. Um, so it is likely natural. Um, uh, it hasn't reached Australasia yet, but um, that is also highly likely this season. So that, that, Pacific Flyway is just opening up now, as we hit spring in the in the in the the southern hemisphere. Understood. Thanks, uh, Graham. You had a comment. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, my I guess my question is, what's is there an end game for this? I mean, my my expertise with this is is zero, and I'm really just uh, ref referring any experience of what's happened from a global pandemic with with covid um and just you know so what you know what is the future is this uh are all the restrictions and the risks etc are they is this forever or is this something that we live with for a, a few years what what's the end game um in terms of conservation there's very very little we can do uh, and and it's really hard to be here talking like such doom and gloom and also there is nothing we can do other than be our best biosecure selves. Um, is there an end game? Well, given there's no intervention that we can think of, we certainly can't vaccinate at scale. Um, this is, I know you volunteered, Graham. <laughs> and it's I, nice I will know. volunteer to vaccinate penguins all day long. <laughs> Um, the uh, I think the most likely scenario is that um, is that if it gets there, we let it burn through, and then we relax conditions because this is not our additional biosecurity and our additional um, risk mitigation is not. It, it's to not be the ones to spread it. If it's there, and particularly after a season where we would hope there wasn't such mortality, this would be a lot less of an issue. Um, because our likelihood of spreading it is low but reasonable. Our likelihood of getting it is incredibly low. So the if we're if within a couple of years there's very low mortality, or there's low mortality and we're following the five meter rule, then the risk to us is very low as well. That's great, thank you. Uh, we had one question in the chat from Danny. He's curious if uh, given seals are catching avian flu, are they potentially a vector to bring them to South Georgia and spread them to birds as well and ditto the peninsula? Um, the first part, absolutely. For spreading to birds, um, yes, if there was a mechanism, you know, if there was a, a dead seal and a, a scavenger then spreading it into a, a bird colony, then yes, that is a mechanism. Um, and, and like, you know, we're all immunology experts now post-COVID, um, we know that the you know the non-symptomatic individuals do exist, and we think this exists with avian flu as well. So, just a question from from my side. Obviously, we're all aware of the biosecurity and everything we need to do, um, and the reality of that in the field is going to be 
quite challenging um, when you look at all the, the new protocols for for this season um, in terms of like the, the pre-landing checks and, and so on and reporting. Um, and actually making this happen with, with the guests is, is going to be quite hard. You know, the things like not kneeling, not sitting, not doing all of these things. And it's, it's how we make that work in the field in a way that's not kind of policing in such a way, but making them responsible uh, for their own actions and behaviours as well. It's, it's, it's going to be quite a, quite a challenge. Yes. So two parts to that. I think um, the for the pre-landing checks, um, visual observations um, for about five minutes make a huge difference because you'll see if there's a mass mortality, and in which case, doesn't matter if it's avian flu or not, it's a good idea not to land. Um, and you'll also see... so. Last year, there were a few reports that turned out not to be avian flu. But if there's one individual behaving a bit weird, you know, we all see that of a season, uh, you know, an individual that's hungry, that's tired, that might have some other disease. Um, that's normal. The symptoms of avian flu that are consistent across, um, across all taxa are neurological. So acting very strange, moving in circles, um, twitching in seals, it seems to be a kind of head up posture or a really abnormal posture. And not just one, several. Um, yeah, that those visual checks are actually uh, quite important. And I, I think you would see them. Um, it's also why we're recommending people to take video. So if you do land and you see something like this, take video because it's really helpful uh, to understand if if we think that is real and then we'll send it around a bunch of experts to see, uh, to get a consensus. Um, and, um, and secondly, what you're saying about uh, kneeling and sitting, I mean, the, the problem is only biosecurity. If you could um, wash everyone, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, the issue is whether they're reporting that, whether you can follow up on it. Um, the the level of biosecurity we're thinking of is what we've got used to on South Georgia. That's great. We have a, another question here about... Oh, Ali, did you have a comment or question? I was just Yeah, just going back to something Tom said about like, seeing individuals. Um, I mean, what percentage of a colony would have to be affected before you didn't land. If you saw one bird, 10 birds. Yeah, and it's, it's I, making that kind of decision, I think, I, on the spot. Personally, I think um, one is never an issue, but two or more. Um, maybe if you've landed and you're a guide, then just pause the landing and watch a bit longer. Um, and maybe even go back aboard and see if you can send a video. Um, but um, one of anything is not an issue, even if it turns out to be avian flu down the line, um, because it's so hard to diagnose. Um, but two or more, I think that's where it, um, and, and it's basically animals doing really weird stuff, either posture and holding it or or behaving very strangely and walking around in circles, swimming around in circles. Um, it's neurological. And we see that across all the birds that have been affected and all of the, the mammals that have been affected. Have you got videos that you could put somewhere? I believe they are embedded in the SCAR report. Um, and if not, yes, absolutely. And there's also videos in the IATO webinar on uh, avian flu as well. And we, I found those really helpful to, to see, to get a feel for what that looks like. We have a question in the chat again for you, Tom, asking how novel is it that avian flu is potentially going to hit these Antarctic and South Georgia birds? Like, do we have any idea when would have been the last time something like this would have happened to them? Yeah. So to follow up on the last, I think it's really important that your one or two experienced naturalists from each team have seen those videos. 
I think that would help a lot. Um, but then um, the, so is this a natural long-term event? Um, this avian flu is called highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, we have found over previous years, low pathogenic avian influenza, uh, and that's present in a lot of um, penguins in Antarctica, as well as other seabirds. Um, so the problem here is that, uh, like a COVID, this is a novel one in the sense that it's mutated and it's highly pathogenic, which means that it spreads very fast and it's more acute when you catch it. So we know that um, we know that in the past avian influenzas have reached Antarctica, and it's probably probably likely that those um, did kill birds and then became less pathogenic. Um, but um, we've never seen anything like this. And this is, this is something that has swept around the world. So is novel in that sense. Um, so this is definitely an unusual one. Sorry, Alex, you just uh, slightly muted there. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Um, I say thanks for that, Tom. I'm going to move on uh, now and ask Lisa to comment a little on what of uh, last year's avian flu procedures we're continuing and what might be new to staff this year and what might be new to staff who should have been doing it last year as well and also where to access resources and so on. So from uh, the IATO point of view, uh, what might be new for us uh, for avian flu? What are the must knows? Yeah, so I I did put it in the uh, chat as well, but the 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 biosecurity instructions these have all been updated um, for this year, and the there is a little square box on some of the must dos of avian influenza. Um, as I auto, We've been taking this very seriously since last year, um, but in, in particular on this year, we've started to prepare operators um, for avian influenza and the possible impacts that it could have to the season since July. Um, so one of the first things that we, we've been doing is communicating this information about what will continue for the season, but also uh, we provided um, operators with a some information that they can put in their pre-departure information because one of the, you know, some of the feedback that we were getting from last year from the staff was that um, they felt like the guests were arriving a little bit unprepared and, and they were having to to do the policing right there as they got on the ship. So hopefully some of that will be alleviated this year because guests are being prepared before they even leave home um, with this information that the operators. We um, have also been working very closely. Um, it's really been um, on the Antarctic community, um, IATO, SCAR, Comnap have all been working really closely together uh, so that this becomes a, um, an entire, you know, Antarctic community response um, and how we're all going to to react. We've kind of split out the information, so um, and and Will can can say something to this for those operators who may be carrying scientists and and what is expected of them and the scientific work that may be going on versus what is the day to day standards of um, Antarctic field staff. So. Within, um, for instance, the risk assessment within certain policies for flying drones um, by scientists, all of that should be housed with the operator and they have specific standard operating procedures on how to work with their scientists. And then the operator will share that with appropriate staff on board. Um, that's to, to help mitigate that side of things. On the, on the seasonal side, one of the, you know, we, we continue with the no sitting, no kneeling, no crouching. Um, and that's uh, even on the sitting stools, um, that's still sitting. Uh, so no chairs, no stools to, to lean on. Um, 
we have created several new materials to help also support you on board in that respect and getting that in the in the the guest eyesight day after day. So um, there's a new poster uh, that that can be displayed on board. Uh, currently, we're just finishing up translations for more, but the English is available in the field staff section of the um, of the website. Like last year, we have an updated um, supplementary video that you can play. Um, this is not to, yeah, I'm the one who did the video. This is not for a, a, a plug for myself, but rather this video is is simply so that um, you can play it to the guests and they can hear a little bit more about avian influenza. The mandatory briefing is also um, just finishing up being updated and that um, goes even more into that keeping that distance and it also has the ability so you can add slides on your own you'll have the same formatting so you can add additional information should you want to the mandatory briefing so the big big things that you really want to keep in mind especially for the expedition leaders is that pre-landing assessment that Tom was talking about super important, build enough time into your landings. We all know how it goes. You know, you're rushing from one thing to the next, you're you're rushing out the door after lunch and just wanna get people ashore. You really, really, really have to take that time to assess the landing. Um, the other part is this year, the five meters, 15 feet in Antarctica. Um, now, South Georgia, I say, hi, Allison. Um, I see you on the screen or uh, in the audience. Um, the South Georgia has different um, parameters based on, of course, that it is very difficult to keep that five meters in anywhere in South Georgia. Um, but within Antarctica, if you go to a landing, let's say Nico Harbor, you go to the nice sandy beach on the end and you see a whole bunch of penguins sitting there and you cannot land without moving them or without keeping that five meters, 15 feet, landings are not possible um, this year. You must, must, as you heard Tom, that distance is so important. Um, you must keep that distance from penguins. It, the one-off penguin, you know, strolling down the beach, that's not a big, big deal. It's the, the, the bigger groups of penguins, moving them, getting closer than five meters, 15 feet. Um, it's really important that you keep that and, and be prepared. So we, we've, we have been preparing again operators and hopefully they've been talking to you um, for those of you in the field, but what are your plan B, C? What kind of Zodiac cruises can you do in the area? What other activities um, that you engage them in some other you know, uh, marine citizen science or, or cloud citizen science um, so that, uh, so that you do have those those options and also um, supporting you in the field when you have to go to a guest and say, I'm sorry, we're not doing a landing because there are just too many penguins on the landing. Um, we all love the penguins, but um, that distance is so important. Also, as you heard Tom, South Georgia level biosecurity, imagine Every single time that you come back from a landing, uh, pretend there's a government officer there uh, looking at, at the boots and your trousers and your sleeves and the packs and, and everything else. Um, you really have to make sure that all of that is is clean and then into the Vercon um, and the Vercon needs to, to dry. And then reporting is a big thing. Um, within the community, we've got a separate WhatsApp group for, um, for Falkland, South Georgia, and then another one for the peninsula, but there is an emergency group so that all stakeholders can be notified. Um, and with that, be prepared for landing sites or even regions to be closed during the season. We do expect that um, some sites may or may not reopen. We will um, update you as to that chain of command, but the first stop, your EL, that's the person who should be, you know, if you're the one who's scouting the landing, you tell the EL, EL then reports it to his operator and to IATO, and IATO will then take care of notifying the rest of the stakeholders if we're the first ones to, to get that notification. And then the last is just when in doubt, don't land. Um, that's the biggest thing that we can, can say is just um, 
I know it's hard and it is going to be, it's going to be an incredibly challenging season for those in the field. And we're here to support you again on that. If you need tools, if you need more information, we'll do our best to get, to get those to you. Um, but we really want to make sure that um, we are doing our part as part of that larger Antarctic stakeholder group um, to, you know, mitigate the spread in any way that we possibly can. That's great. Sorry. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, no, that was uh, that was really good. Um, can I just ask, would it also be worthwhile in the case where you see something suspect? Let's imagine you're at Coverville in the morning and you know there's a ship coming in the afternoon to also contact that ship directly as well as uh, the ship scheduler uh, email. Yeah. Um, and we do have that broadcast system in the um, in the live ship scheduler where you can just hit all Antarctic Peninsula ships and it'll go to to everyone. So definitely report it as soon as you may have an inkling. To OK, everyone. so you would say report it to the whole fleet as soon as you have a suspicion. We we prefer we prefer not. Um, for you to, sorry, I don't mean to confuse things. We would prefer you not. We'd prefer you to contact us because we will then get at, reach out to the ships directly that um, will be landing at that site the next time. So if you go in, Alex, you're landing at Coverville, you see something um, and you report it to us, we'll immediately assess and then we'll contact, turn around and contact all of those ships who may be landing there within the next 48 hours. Yeah, understood. Does that broadcast system include yachts? Um, we we have a separate communication system with the yachts. Uh, some are on it if they want to be, it depends on their bandwidth. Most will be this year, thanks to Starlink. Um, but we also have a separate communication feed for the yachts um, ourselves, which will get that information to them. That's great. Thank you. So I think this segues us very nicely into the first of our tough questions. But before we do that, I was wondering if um, Steffi and Ali, as our expedition leaders, if you'd be able to make um, any comments, um, I guess, from a philosophical point of view, on our roles as stewards of the environment and that part of us like making a big, strong effort with biosecurity and making sure we're following both the letter and the spirit of the guidelines. So, so Steffi, do you have any comments first? Yeah, I love your question, Alex. Thank you. Um, I guess I actually have a question in response to this question. I have a question for Tom. Tom, am I right in thinking that this strain of avian flu, so H5N1, came originally, the precursor was after an outbreak in geese, farmed geese in China. Is that right? Yeah, um, geese and ducks, primarily ducks. And it was in a series of large lakes there for several years. And then it, it it's likely it was a mutation that suddenly caused it to, or helped it to spread. Uh, it's been around for, I think, three to four years now. And it, um, it reached South Africa. Um, it was there for a couple of years, but then it was last year that it really spread through Europe, the Palearctic, and then down through South America. Cool, thank you. And just to confirm my understanding, um, so the transition from low pathogenic avian influenza to high pathogenic avian influenza tends to happen when it goes from wild birds into domesticated birds, so farmed birds. Is that right? So this kind of mark? No, not necessarily it can be the other way around but there was okay. definitely there was a large reservoir um of susceptible individuals so it went mm -hmm. through the poultry industry there mm -hmm. um, it was a, there was a reservoir of wild birds and it, i don't think it's entirely clear which way it went from mm -hmm. the two. um it's been there for a while so it might have happened several times and that that's the nature of a res reservoir is that you know, you get infected and then even if you clear an infection, you can get reinfected. Yeah. Uh, so that's that bit is very complex and I'm not going to pretend to <laughs> have data on it. The reason that I asked the question is I think that part of the way that we as guides, as expedition leaders, as expedition staff kind of message this to the guests is that it's not just happening to us. It's not that avian flu is happening to us. It's kind of that we are also part of the story. 
Um, and it actually is an amazingly tangible um, a tangible example of the fact that things that happen in the rest of the world affect Antarctica and things that happen in Antarctica affect the rest of the world. So, for example, if we are talking about geese in China that were being farmed, what were those geese being used for? Were they being used for meat? Or were they being used for the down in my puffy jacket that I'm wearing right now? You know, it's I think I think the the piece for me is there's we, we will have to do, you know, an element of telling people what the guidelines are and of really reinforcing that and making sure that we are being role models while we're out there and not crouching, um, not sitting. But I do think there's another piece of understanding of helping the guests understand that this is also a human thing. It's not just um, the natural world that's that's kind of, it's happening in, it's it's part of the human story. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the human footprint outside Antarctica affects Antarctica. Um, one third of the world is given over to human food production. And a lot of that is where disruption, that's where zoonoses come from through habitat fragmentation, through intensive um, agriculture and livestock production. Um, yes, that is all linked 100%. And I think that, yes, that can be quite a powerful message. Cool. Thank you for clarifying some of my understanding. But yeah, Alex, um, in terms of like how we message this, like for me, that's going to be a piece of how I want to do it is is to kind of help guests understand a little bit of the the biology to understand where this avian flu has come from. Um, so that it's not just happening to us. We are not just inactive, passive um, actors in this. We are part of the story of avian flu, um, which perhaps then helps us um, self-regulate with like making sure that we are all following the guidelines because we also do have um, a say in how it's going to develop in Antarctica and the rest of the world. Um, yeah, that's my thing. Ali, do you have any thoughts? Um, I actually spent some time this afternoon putting together a, a new kind of briefing that I want to do on board and it is specifically on biosecurity. I did one a couple of years ago um, for South Georgia and I had a long conversation with the, the guys at the office there about having um, a briefing that was available for expedition leaders and, and staff and he said it was a great idea and it never happened so I was working on, on that this afternoon and it's for me it's about making sure that people take ownership of this whole thing. Um, it seems to work in South Georgia is like knowing that what they're doing is of a benefit um, you know, the whole biosecurity, the cleaning, the not kneeling, the, the distance and all that kind of thing. I think the hardest thing will be is if you you can't land, if you, you know, like Lisa was saying, if you've got a large group of penguins on the beach and then you get there and you go, OK, so plan B, what are we going to do? And you've got people kind of waiting on board at the gangway, maybe. Um, and, you know, you now need to go Zodiac cruising. So instead of four boats, you now need seven boats or 10 boats and it's all that kind of logistics um, and kind of satisfying people's kind of expectations really of, of their trip. Um, but as long as they've got a sense of ownership of, of what they're doing and what they're understanding, like you say, of why they're doing it um, and their part that they're going to play, um, that's that's got to be the, the way forward. But I can, yeah, I can see crunch points uh, when people aren't quite getting the trip that maybe they were expecting to get and then that swings back to the the pre-departure information and we we know from many many years of experiences uh they might have been told that you know the information this is what you need to bring this is what you need to do to prepare for and then they come on board and it's slightly different so that i think we still have some way to go but i guess as as staff and expedition leaders will yeah taking on board the sense of ownership and, and making sure that uh, we do what we can uh, with the guests. That's great. Thank you, Ali. So we're going to move on now to our tough questions. And the first one, we're actually staying on this topic. So our tough questions were voted on by, uh, by guides. And our most popular question was, while modified for South Georgia, this year, keeping the five meter distance will be imperative in Antarctica when choosing to make landings. An operator will not be able to land in Antarctica if doing so causes guests or guides to be closer than five meters to a group of wildlife with the one-off animal being acceptable. 
how do we prepare ourselves and the guests for non-landed landed activities? And I'm going to start by uh, going to Will. Uh, so, Will, I know you've, uh, you were a guide for many years, and now you're giving us the operator perspective. Uh, from your point of view as an operator, um, what are you doing to prepare guests um, for this possibility, and indeed for the possibility that landing sites may get closed altogether? Yeah, tough question, Alex. Uh, I like it. Uh, and uh, and thank you. There's been some fantastic suggestions made already on this topic. But from an operations perspective, I think first and foremost, it, it's it's front loading this concept uh, to passengers uh, before they arrive in the vessel, and um, it's it's hard. Uh, as Ali suggested, people don't read their pre-departure documentation uh, sometimes, and so it's we really focus on how to increase the amount of touch points that we have with our clients prior to them joining the vessel. The more information we front load, the more likely it is that they are prepared for a, for a change. And another point, which I think is really important to make is uh, in our preparation for the season ahead, we're looking at it through a few different lenses. It's, it's you know, ideally we can sort of run land operations, but if we can't, how do we prepare to do non-land excursions? And, um, Steffi actually raised this recently to me the other day, and, and it's it's and I it, re it resonated quite well with me as a guide too. And it was a point of personal acceptance and kind of like grieving over the loss of the season, not a loss of the season per se, but uh, of, of of change this season. Guides uh, and our team really need to accept that it's going to be different, and it's crazy to think that you just can't go down to Antarctica anymore and, and do what we were doing for, for decades past. This year, we have to think differently and really re-assess uh, how we operate and reinvent how we experience Antarctica. And part of that is, is explaining to guests why it's important that we do these things. And Ali, you raised a really interesting point about getting that buy-in and explaining the why. And once you get people understanding the why, they buy into it themselves as well. Uh, so I, I think from an operator's perspective, it's certainly front-loading that it's explaining the why, but it's also preparing our team for the realities of Antarctica. And that may be like leaning on, you know, more on-ship programs. It's leaning into on-water experiences. It's uh, leaning into programs that may only uh, originally be for 10 people. Why not scale that to 100 people and just do it in 10 times, you know, and just to get people seeing Antarctica differently? Uh, I think another thing we've been trying to work on is guides, and I'll put my hand up to be the first person to admit this. You know, we're constantly comparing our experiences. Um, maybe just you know, in our minds, uh, personally, we're just thinking, oh, last year was the best, or last so that uh, voyage was it was incredible. However, um, that mindset won't necessarily be overly helpful this season. So I think it's just important to be open to to new ways of experiencing Antarctica. And bringing that enthusiasm and excitement to clients, because as we all know, you know, clients don't really have anything to compare to. And so if, if we bring that mentality of comparing other trips and other seasons to this season, I think it'll just get the wrong uh, tone and wrong experience. But if we kind of really embrace the new, embrace the difference and think about like, how can we slow down and, and, and have a different experience in Antarctica, I think we'll still be able to um, deliver a very, um yeah you know, a different but equally as 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 you know transformative experience in a target for our clients yeah that's a, a great answer thank you will and uh i you didn't say it exactly but you touched on this i hate that phrase but we've always done it this way and uh sometimes it's good to acknowledge like you're right we have always done it that way and now we're doing it a different way and we're going to accept that. I thought that's really good. Thank you. Um, uh, Steffi, maybe you could, um, given you're working for the same operator as well, elaborate a little on can we run a good trip without landing at Penguin Colonies? Oh, good question. Um, I mean, to follow on from Will's, Will's chat, um, I kind of think that in terms of what the future is going to look like, what the season is going to look like, plan A is, is okay, avian flu doesn't arrive. 
but I really want to be ready for plan B, plan C, plan D. And plan B might be like, okay, we can land in some places. Plan D might be, we can't land right now. And I really want in like personally, and also for all of the staff on all the ships, I want us to be ready for that with ideas of how we're going to run things differently. So for example, and I haven't spoken to Will about this, but what about a daily polar plunge? You know, morning polar dip, we do this. Love it. Love it. <laughs> but there's, there's different ways of doing this. And we need to be like thinking in that man mentality of like, what happens when, and not just what happens if, because I, as a guide, um, do not want to be caught off guard by avian flu because it seems, you know, scientifically, um, it, the odds are stacked in the, 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 you know, the fact that it's going to happen. And so right now, when we can, like getting our in our mindset of like, how do we run this trip without, without doing X, Y, or Z? I think there's there's ways for us to to do that. And that, for example, could be, uh, you know, polar plunges in the morning when people wake up. That would be lovely. It could be, um, you know, a focus on Zodiac cruising. How do we better experience Zodiac cruising? How do we incorporate meditation? Um, there's like no end to what we can do, but I think it's um, reframing. And I totally agree with you, Alex, in terms of, yes, there's there's a context of what we've always done in expedition cruising. Um, for example, even a context for how do we how do we raise money for charities? We run an auction. But is that the only way that it has to be? Um, no, there is. So there's other ways of doing that. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'm at with preparing and thinking about how do we prepare our teams um, for that possibility? That's great. Thank you, Steffi. Ali, I was wondering, from your point of view as an expedition leader, if you could expand at all on Will's concept of avoiding this, you should have been here last year kind of mentality, like accepting this is what Antarctica is, and we're going to embrace and enjoy it and not be disappointed that we can't do something. Yeah, um, I think... Our, my constant battle, I'm not saying battle, but the biggest thing dealing with is passenger expectation. Um, and this goes back to what they've seen on TV, what they've seen on social media, what they see in the brochures. I mean, just looking at the two backgrounds that we have on the screen there, you know, you've got this beautiful Antarctic environment and um, people go with an expectation of that is what they've seen on social media is what they're going to have as their experience. And one of my points is always to say to them is like, this is your trip and it may be very, very different to what you're expecting. You know, you might have a husband and wife come on board and their image, their view of the trip might be very different in both of their heads, but it's it doesn't mean it's a bad trip just because it's different to what you're expecting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for many years. Um, and I think in the early days, we just took people to Antarctica. And, and that was what we did. And they embraced that and enjoyed that experience. But there's all these add-on layers of, of what people are expecting to do. It's like to the point where we're paddleboarding and well, yeah, some companies are paddleboarding and um, all these levels of expectation just complicate things. And it's almost like if you could just clear all of that and just go, do you know what? We're gonna go to Antarctica. Let's just see what we find when we get there. Um, and everything's a bonus after that. But that's probably quite a personal point of view. Um, but I think if you go with that mindset from the beginning, like when you do your first briefing on board as you're going down the Beagle Channel, um, then that hopefully everything else kind of builds up from that. And yeah, doesn't lead to disappointment that, oh, we didn't land at Nico or I haven't done a continental landing because that's always going to be a challenge as well um, if places end up getting closed. Um, and it's that that level of expectation. So, yeah, let's see how it goes. Let's just go to Antarctica and enjoy it. Yeah, that expectation setting is so important. Graham, you had a comment. Yeah, I was just um, riffing off uh, Steffi and Will, actually, uh, gave me an idea. Uh, at, the, at the introduction, I was banging on about in, um, thematic interpretation. Something that may be worth considering if people aren't doing it is Obviously, within any expedition team, there'll be some people who are more experienced and more skilled at coming up with uh, a great theme or story uh, for a particular um, Zodiac cruise. And if you're finding that you're doing many Zodiac cruises, perhaps your pre-excursion expedition team briefing are 
having someone who you know drops the theme on the team and then and everybody has a, the same theme uh, and they and all the guides can learn something out of it and then do their very best to create an engaging story for yet another zodiac cruise um, so that that human interaction and as as Steffi and Will have both said that that human engagement uh, becomes you know a more integral part of operations. Just a thought. Mm. Absolutely, I, I, I love that, Graham. Um, and just to jump in here, Ali, uh, your your point about um, guest expectations. Uh, and and this, the change that we've seen, I, I think guests are more educated, they're more well researched, and they have higher expectations now than they ever have been. And I think it's 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 also arguably on the shoulders of the expedition guide in the zodiac telling the story, telling the theme, Graham. And your point is it's it's so important. They this season has there's the opportunity for for guides to really up. Uh, or, or expand on their repertoire uh, of stories and zodiac um, activities and, and objectives and and just the the art of a zodiac cruise and and Steffi uh, has some incredible insights into this as well. So I don't want to steal your thunder there, but it's it's so important that they captain the guests' experience, and it comes from that touch point, that connection that they have, that bond that they have with with guests. Uh, that is the most important thing in, in managing expectations. People might be like, oh, you know, I really wanted to see Orca. Well, it's like, hey, let's talk about, you know, the, the likelihood of seeing Orca. Let's talk about what the incredible other things that we can see. Let, let's, let's focus in the here and the now on this Zodiac cruise and, and the storytelling we can do right here rather than comparing and managing expectations. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's great. Thanks, Will. I often find every trip has something unusual about it. And sometimes at the end of the trip, I'll say to the guests, what has been really special this trip has been how much we've seen of this or the fact this happened. And then, you know, every trip has something special or unusual that you file away in the back of your head. Like that was an interesting trip because that thing happened. And I think if you you know, say to guests, this is a great thing that happened, then suddenly it's a great, exciting trip, even though they didn't see Orca, for example. Um, Graham, I wanted to ask you, getting onto the no uh, sitting or leaning thing, how we deal with passengers compassionately and while at the same time enforcing this, because it can be sometimes, you know, someone falls over in the snow and what you want to say is you absolute donkey, why did you do that? How do we deal with people compassionately? And at the same time, people who struggle to stand for an hour and do need to lean on something, how do we manage that as guides? You're asking me that? I'm probably the least qualified to answer that because I would side more naturally uh, on what you said first, <laughs> so I you have a reputation as a brash talker, but I know you're a you're a thoughtful person at heart. I I would happily defer to Ali and Steffi for a far more considered approach to this, um, uh, <clears throat> because it's not my natural tendency. I would have to uh, dig deeper into um, finding role models of my own of role models of mine and try to basically model what they might do. And it would be a far more considered approach of um, just as we've been talking about, digging deeper into uh, the story and the here and now of, uh, of what's going on for people and why this is why this is important. That's all I'd have at this stage. I'd prefer someone with more expertise and a personality type more suited to that. And I will <laughs> learn from it. Okay, Ali, how about you? In dealing with passengers who can't stand or fall over or distance, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I don't know because I, I had made a few notes this afternoon, and um, this whole kind of crouching does it apply to absolutely everywhere, even if it's somewhere where there's fresh snow, or how how do we deal with camping? Because clearly people are going to be obviously the the campsite venues are going to be wildlife free. 
but is that going to be an issue as well? Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I'd be gentle and compassionate, and I wouldn't refer to anybody as a donkey, Alex. <laughs> But when you, so maybe Steph, you might have comments. Let's imagine you've got someone and they're just really struggling. And I know I ended up doing this uh, last season. I let someone lean on the shore barrel because she was just really struggling to stand for that long. I ended up letting her lean there and I stood nearby and I was just, from the point of view of the spirit of the guidelines, I felt it was okay because I could see there was no wildlife for hundreds and hundreds of meters and I could get her moving if something came close. But, you know, what other advice would you have for managing these things compassionately? I mean, Alex, I think that's a really reasonable solution. I think that I think that for all of us as guides, it's not coming, um, you know, when someone asks us a question of something they need, it's making sure that we're not responding from a place of like, I don't have time for that. But it's responding from a place of like, even if I can't give you what you want, how can I facilitate it for you? So for example, can we pop you back in a Zodiac? You can sit in a Zodiac and that driver who's spare can drive you around and do a little bit of a cruise. Um, so I think it's a little bit about, I'm, I'm a massive fan of, of really making sure the passengers know that we are on their side. We want to give them those things so much. There are some things that we can't, won't be able to budge on. So for example, am I gonna let you know someone sit in the middle of a penguin colony? I'm not, but I'm going to figure out a way that they can be comfortable and hopefully get the best experience possible. And so I think it's a little bit about the messaging of like, I'm going to try my hardest to give you what you need, um, even if it's not exactly in the way that you would like it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. I think sometimes acknowledging that what you're insisting on is very frustrating goes yeah. a really long way to say you know that you're being really annoying. Okay, I think we're going to move on to our second tough question now. And I hope the discussion we've had here has um, really uh, helped uh, those of you who are attending um, to just have some useful thoughts. Um, actually, sorry, there's one thing I wanted to add. And this is a comment for Lisa about Burkon. And I saw it was explicitly noted in the guidelines that Burkon should be used going out and coming back. And I often hear the point of view from guides that it's pointless using it going out and to only use it coming back. And I wonder if you could quickly comment on that just to make sure we're all on the same page. We use it both directions. Yes, um, right now it is the best practice across the stakeholders to to use it on the way out and on the way in. Um, we know that this does cause some confusion, especially now that we have been very, very clear that it does need to dry. Um, but we are constantly looking at the information from the um, from the manufacturer of Vircon and looking at other um, possible substitutes, which we know some operators are looking at this season. Um, but right now, it is on the way back in, dry, and still on the way out, just to to get that double check. That's great. Uh, thank you very much for that. Also a reminder, it doesn't work on dirty boots. Your boots have to be perfectly clean before the Vercon goes on and dries. I just uh, today wrote to Marcelo Flores, who's something of uh, an authority on biosecurity. He's currently in Gripviken. He let me know that Vercon on clean boots allowed to dry on is close to 100% efficacy. If it just goes on wet and doesn't get to dry, it has 60% efficacy. So it does have an effect, even though it doesn't dry on, which is why we use it both directions. Okay, so going on now to our second tough questions as voted on by guides. Uh, why isn't there more being done at guide level to share incidents and accidents for our learning? Can IATO do more or is this not possible? And so I thought I'd make, I, I'm particularly interested here on the view from Lisa from IATO and Will as an operator, but particularly as an operator who came from a guiding background. So first mm -hmm. of all, Lisa, would you be able to give us um, any sort of uh, viewpoint on this? Because as a guide, sometimes it feels like something occurs, we know it gets reported and discussed, but it doesn't feel like much filters down to us all the time. Yeah, and and I completely understand that. And this is something that Graham and myself and also Kim and myself, we've been having uh, discussions about. 
So the way it works, and and you know, we all know about the incidents from from last season, which are still under investigation. Um, we as IATO can only share information which is um, allowed by the operator. So any information that comes out, whether it be to you as guides or to public, uh, the public news um, needs to be okayed from the operator in which the incident happened. So um, what may not be overly apparent, for instance, is that this is discussed behind the scenes and perhaps it doesn't come out um, as that it's dealing with a specific incident, but when incidents do happen, they go to the appropriate committees and working groups within IATO, and they are looked at and assessed. So certainly last year, um, after the early season incidents, we did have a town hall for the operators. And most recently, we have had um, a, uh, um, a webinar with the Zodiac North America about Zodiac maintenance and um, how to bring that to the forefront of everybody's knowledge. Um, and so everyone out in the field has that information. Similar to the helicopter guidelines, these incidents were reported uh, to IATO. Um, they were moved to the helicopter working group and then new guidelines came into place. So we realized that perhaps sometimes we're not able to address the information directly about that incident in such a, a straightforward manner. But please note that when incidents do happen, we are doing our best to constantly assess and evolve the tools um, and bring those changes about through the appropriate channels um, within IATO itself. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Will, can you comment at all? Because as I say, you know, you were a guide for a long time and now you're looking from the operator position. What are your concerns from an operator position with information being shared that you maybe didn't appreciate before when you were a guide? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, and I just want to uh, reiterate Lisa's point. You know, we do need to be um, sensitive and, and mindful of ongoing investigations uh, of, of instances, um, uh, major instances. But Alex, from my perspective as a guide now in, in operations, I, I think there's a, a huge importance to reflect on instances as an, in, as an industry and, and as, a, as, a, as an operator. Um, and it, it's not, it's, you know, we, we will learn, and, and as Lisa said, that there are, you know, debriefs and, and lessons learned from these major uh, events. But for me and, and, and from my experience, I think it's, it's the small ones. It's those close calls. It's the, it's the little instances that all add up. Um, and unfortunately, you know, um, in, in my six or seven years of guiding, uh, back in the day, I probably had about, uh, I probably had one or two near misses and I probably saw about five or six. Uh, and that's scary to think about that. It's scary to think that that just one person having those uh, experiences and hopefully it wasn't just me. Um, uh, but I think that there are in, uh, these situations occurring frequently each season. And if we had a one centralized area where we can share these uh, near misses, share these minor incidences. I think there'll be a lot to learn from. And as a professional guiding community, uh, this is common. This is standard practice across all the other guiding communities around the world to debrief and to assess how we do things and to really manage and, and do things better and learn from the mistakes. You know, if you fail to learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. I'm uh, just taking a uh, borrowing line from, from Winston Churchill. But, you know, it's, it's, I think it's really, really important. Um, so I, I do like the initiative from PTGA with this uh, minor incident uh, reporting uh, form this season. I think it will go a long way. I think that one of the, the the roadblocks that we've had in the past uh, from operators is is you know sharing information that's operator specific uh, in an incident that may have occurred with guests, and that kind of gets into this uh, awkward territory where you know that it maybe there there is internal investigation already happening maybe there is a lawsuit maybe it you know there's a lot more complicated and i think we just have to be very mindful about that and if there's any learning that we can make it from a situation uh, or from experiences that don't involve guests or don't involve an active situation on board the ship 
uh, then I think we just have to be very careful in, in, in separating the two and just being respectful and mindful of that. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Will. I see a comment here from Shelley. Uh, I get. I wonder if that's uh, the legend Shelley Larson uh, saying it's very important to uh, sit down with your team after an incident or a near miss to discuss it. But as you say, it's very important to share this more widely within the industry. And Graham, maybe you could just uh, make sure everybody knows now about uh, the system PTGA has. So if you have a surprise or a near miss or something uh, you didn't expect that might be useful for other people to um, see or hear, I think uh, we all read in the last Guano Happens uh, about the avalanche at uh, Foyne Harbor that it had been noted that it was high risk by another ship in the days beforehand. And actually it was Steffi here now who a uh, few days before had said, I don't think it's safe to be here, but IZL didn't share that with the community uh, just a few days beforehand. So maybe you could talk to us about uh, um, the sharing opportunities within PTGA. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Uh, well, let me just first say that, you know, as, as Lisa had mentioned, any, any huge incident uh, that happens, fatality or major injury and rescue type thing, has to go and run through Arto because... Uh, there, there's a lot more uh, international and compliance nuance in there than even that PTGA is not uh, party to, uh, and nor do we want to. We, you know, we fully understand that we cannot be involved in those. What I can tell our membership is that uh, we do have a good relationship with IATO, and on Guide's behalf, I do pester Lisa. Uh, for these things, but we have a healthy in relationship and engagement where it's very clear that if Lisa can tell me something, she will, to try to amplify these messages on your behalf. Uh, and if she can't, then that's completely understood. Um, but from uh, your perspective, please know that PTGA will try, but we also understand uh, the boundaries that we have to operate by. We have instigated, as people have pointed out, uh, one of the, the I, I think for me, the model or a way to think about this from getting information to guides, understand that IATO is there first and foremost for from that perspective and PTGA sits where it sits. It's a matter of finding that, that ground which is allowable for us to uh, to amplify and circulate those messages. And that's an ongoing process as we figure those things out. What we are encouraging people, uh, given from what Alex, what you said about the Foyne Harbour incident, is to have a forum where we can try it out, where we've, we've just called it surprises. If you are a guide and you're out there operating and you have a surprise somewhere or other, oh, there's some cracks in the snow, or boy, I was looking at the um, I was looking at the uh, the, the blue-eyed shag colony at Paradise Harbour and I was a little bit closer and rocks fell down and landed six feet away from my zodiac. People aren't, there's not litigation and suing going on from those sorts of things, but that's super critical information to, to be able to put out to other guides. And PTGA, you know, by all means, go to IATO and, and suggest that uh, there's maybe some instability under the shag colony, uh, the turn colony, however you want to refer to it. Um, and that that may be of notice. IATO is probably too busy to deal with that kind of stuff, but they may be able to, to, to use it. But similarly, PTGA can amplify and help via its own channels because IATO speaks to, can speak to a lot of guides and PTGA can speak to uh, a good number of guides as well. And between the two of us, we hope that we can get that crucial information out there better moving forward. So you know, by all means, if you uh, certainly this season, if you have a surprise, you you hit a rock somewhere, you've had rocks fall, or you've seen a you know a snow avalanche into the water, or some other thing which made you go, "Whoa, my colleagues, my professional colleagues should really know about this." Then you know, by all means, get in touch with us. Um, you can do that and totally anonymously on the PTGA website, uh, and uh, and IATO needs to know, of course, that if there's you know, we're sensible enough in this day and age that if anything, even if I see anything, if it looks 
like mm, this is troubled water right here, then I get in touch with Lisa and we chat about it and decide what we can do. So it's a collaborative effort, uh, and I really hope that we can move things forward this season. All right, that's great. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, just quickly to add on to what Graham said, um, there is a, a a process, as you all are aware, of reporting incidents, um, and we know that we receive incidents from different um, vectors, either directly from the operator or from you in the field. So you in the field letting us know immediately through the ship scheduler email address or through the operations email address that there's a new crevasse. Um, that's super important. So we can get that out to the field um, immediately. Uh, so those incident reporting uh, mechanisms that IATO has are still super important. Um, it's one of the reasons why we do have within the operations department people on standby for seven days a week and we have the emergency line. So please, um, yeah, keep those. The only way that we can get the information out to everybody is if we know about that information. Um, so, you know, think of all of your guides and all the things you wish you you had said um, about. Oh, there's a little crack there uh, starting to show up on X uh, X little um, crevasse. Please make sure you you still report that. Um, it's so so important for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, yeah, just to uh, just uh, because Lisa mentioned crevasses um, again, by all means, well, you know, take it to our auto, it needs to be put in there. But also, if you have mountain guides or mountain experienced people, PTGA is trying to build a crevasse uh, inventory. Um, and there will be uh, there'll be some publicity on this in the next week or so. Um, but if you have mountaineers, if you've found a crevasse and you're able to take some GPS measurements, uh, that can feed into our crevasse inventory. We are trying to build uh, a crevasse inventory for our members so that you have some visual, it gives you a visual, um, some visual data uh, as well. And we're trying to build that, but we need, you know, it's crowdsourced. We can't have one person travel around all these sites. So if you have mountain guides or mountain experienced people who uh, can, can do these measurements, that would be much appreciated. Great, thank you. Uh, Ali, could you comment on the value of actually hearing about other people's surprises and near misses to you as an EL? Um, I think it is important that we we share the knowledge. And uh, like Lisa was saying, there are the, the channels for that within IATO. Um, but yes, a lot of these things do get kind of lost amongst, uh, you know, along the way. So yeah, I think there is the value to have uh, a forum for it not just IATA, but maybe, you know, within uh, the PTGA. So, yeah, but it, it's it's another thing in a, a big, busy schedule and report writing and various other things as well. So, but yeah, the more information we have to keep us safe and keep the passengers safe, then the better. Excellent. Thank you, Ali. Steffi. Off. Okay, I'm here. Um, we just put a question out to ask if people like or dislike safety meetings. And I know it's a divisive subject. I know there are people out there who really dislike them. And I can understand why, because they can drag on. It can feel like a waste of time if you have lots of other things going on, which inevitably on an expedition ship, we always have so many other things to do. Um, the other day, I listened to a podcast um, by a guy called Adam Grant. Um, he has a podcast called The Rethinking. And it's about why meetings suck and how to fix them. Um, I definitely advocate anyone um, to listen to it. It's really, really fascinating. And it talks about meetings should be um, for four things only. So do, decide, learn, or bond. My feeling about end of voyage safety meetings is they are about learning. They're not about deciding. You're not gonna change policy right then and there, but it's about us as a group of staff learning. And it has to be highly facilitated. It's not something that um, should be let to go on for a very, very long time. Um, but I think there is so much value um, to be able to fit in a 45 minute session um, on the way back up um, to Ashwaya to facilitate a safety meeting because it really is about learning as a staff team. That's great, thank you, Graham. Uh, yeah, I just to, to add on to all of this, 
you know, it, it's just for to challenge everybody or to encourage everybody, um, just to get into the to have that paradigm shift of reporting incidents within your own teams to to our or to whoever we 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 seem to have been mired, in my opinion, uh, with with this idea that it's bad if if your company has incidents, then you won't report them because. Other companies don't report them, and that makes you look worse or you know a, a lesser operator. As guides, there's a fear. Definitely, I hear from guides there's a fear of reporting and talking about incidents in case uh, that they might have had or near misses because they don't want to lose their job or contract. And you know, to me, that's a big barrier to get over. And these sorts of discussions right here, right now, um, is great. And hearing from our colleagues who are encouraging you know, the more we can infiltrate expedition teams and make and normalize this even within the expedition team. Uh, I don't, you know, it doesn't care about IATA or PTGA, but if you have near misses and you can discuss those in a healthy way, exactly as um, Steffi had said, with uh, if, if the goal is to learn, then then we can, I believe we can really help the the whole industry and keep people safer. Thank you. Well, yeah, I completely agree with that, Graham. Um, what's important, uh, I think, just to to, to re reframe this is, is safety. It, it all comes out the, the the reason why we are interested in in, in uh, hearing about these these surprises or new misses and recording these it, fundamentally is to keep people safe. And um, in Antarctica. The only priority that we have, I believe, is safety. Everything else is secondary. Guest experience, what we see, where we go, what sites we visit, is secondary to keeping people safe. And that, that's, of course, guides, crew, and guests. And there's so much institutional knowledge in this industry. Uh, and it's, it's amazing that we could consider having this centralized depository of information whether it is surprises, new misses, or just industry uh, you know, information that's kind of known now but could get lost. And I think all this information needs to be shared, needs to be uh, dissected across industry, and, uh, and and ultimately will keep people safe. Thank you, Will. I think we'll leave this one here, and I'll just finish. Uh, first of all, I saw the results of the poll in terms of who likes uh, end-of-trip safety meetings, and it was 100% yes. So I just assume the kind of people who don't like those are the kind of people who don't attend these uh, summits. Uh, and finally, uh, we should all remember that misinformation thrives in a vacuum. I remember in a speaker series, uh, someone, it might have been uh, Iggy, uh, commented he'd been on a ship where the bridge windows got blown in by a wave and when he got back to I uh, to Ushuaia the rumor was that they'd hit a rock in the middle of the drape so that's the way misinformation and rumor thrives uh, in the absence of real information okay our final tough question which we're going to try to keep really short because we're at the end of our time there um, is there a way for guides to register their discontent with unregulated growth in Antarctica without getting in trouble with their employers? So I think I'll start with Lisa here as the IATU representative, which is, of course, the representative body for all those employers. <laughs> um, yes, so growth. Uh, growth is here. It's not coming. It's not. It is. It is here. Um, it is something that is constantly being talked about within industry, but also at the treaty party level. And um, we take into account your feedback from the field, your concerns, whether it's by emails, whether it's your operators talking to us about something that has been raised by you in the field. Um, we take that into account as we look at our own strategic plan moving forward. Um, some of you may have heard during Polar Guide Week, you may have heard Gina talk about our strategic plan and our stewardship moving forward. Um, our new strategic plan looks at us as stewards for Antarctica and ways that we can do that and also feed into 
creating um, a protected Antarctica. So I encourage you to also look at that um, webinar that Gina did during Polar Guide Week. So you can find that on the field staff section for those of you field staff, but also um, for a note for you on the, on the treaty level, um, treaty parties continue to be concerned about growth. They continue to be concerned mostly about commercialism overriding the environment. So everything should be about protecting Antarctica. We are visitors. It is a privilege, as we all know, to go there. It's an amazing place. We should also be imparting that type of ambassadorship, that that type of enthusiasm to our, our guests that we, we share these experiences with. Um, within the treaty parties, it's very important that they continue to see all operators, but they look at IATO obviously as the holding 99% of the, all commercial operations to Antarctica. They hold us as those um, helping to uphold those treaty guidelines, those treaty protocols uh, first and foremost. So please keep doing this, keep working with your operator, keep talking about it. Um, your ideas in the field, it, it's great if you just chat with each other um, amongst the staff, but it's even better if those are able to be shared um, and what you're seeing and um, ways that better solutions um, that could come forward. Those are the ways that we're all going to, to get better. So thank you for that, Alex. Thanks, that's really great, Lisa. Uh, Will, uh, maybe you could comment as an operator on this principle of someone getting in trouble with their employer for being uh, unhappy with this situation. Yeah, that's a really good question, Alex. I think it's um I think the answer is there a way to do it without getting in trouble per se? Absolutely, there is. You know, uh, we pride ourselves in, in in hiring good guides around the industry. All operators do, and all guides are great. And just being that professional guide, <laughs> um, being that professional guide means just being uh, understanding the the relationship between the company and, and yourself. And if you have um discontent about the unregulated growth in the industry you can share that you know you're all experts in your own field whether it's you know you're an ornithologist or a glaciologist or if you're a, a political, political scientist you have that insight and you can share that um if you if you have a concern about the company that you work for and then i think as lisa said certainly take that up with the operator and themselves directly um any information with respect uh in a, in a public realm um done respectfully is, is is totally appropriate uh but if you do have concerns with the operator that you're working for i would suggest you take it up with them directly that's great thank you very much uh will so we're going to move on now to some of the questions coming out of the chat and the first one is for tom um and the question or comment is that it may be helpful to share with the field staff how quickly it has been noted that once a bird gets avian influenza, how quickly animals start to die. And the comment is, my understanding is that it is relatively quick, so natural causes may make it obvious soon. Yeah. So from symptoms to death is less than a week. And we can't know exactly, but um, if you see one bird sick, you would see... Um, three to five on day three to four and then it goes exponential so it's incredibly rapid which is also why um one is not a problem two or three needs to be taken seriously and even if you're not sure it's avian influenza if there's been a report of it we're not sure then a, a, a much longer assessment period before landing there but equally, outside of Ayato, um, an assessment from somewhere there's been a suspicion of avian flu is actually incredibly useful. Great. Uh, thank you very much for that answer, Tom. Also, for those who don't know, in the background there is Ted Cheeseman, who is an industry legend. He's one of the founders of the Polar Citizen Science Collective and the creator of Happy Whale, which I hope you're all using. If you see any whales and get some good photos, make sure you submit them to Happy Whale this season. It is the number one citizen science project out there. It's amazing. 
Uh, okay, he lives so under he, my stairs. That's yeah, where he lives under Tom's stairs. Yeah, <laughs> he's visiting Tom so he can learn about penguins. Okay, so moving on, but staying on the subject of avian flu, this one is for Lisa, which I think has been answered in the chat, but I think it'd be good for everyone to hear. Uh, what if a landing is clear of penguins in the beginning, and during the landing, penguins move in on the area from the water and five minute, five meter distances can no longer be sustained, and there are no other suitable landing sites to get guests off the shore? Yes, and, and this is definitely going to be one of the challenges this season so that assessing your landing choosing choosing the right landing to begin with and whether that be for just a regular landing or for camping um, is going to be really important and to look and take that assessment okay beach is cleared now but in in the past have have penguins just shown up on the beach do they come in no matter what the, are they more a more habituated group let's say um, we know that in certain areas there are some more habituated um, penguins to people coming and going so they don't mind as much um, you should be prepared to abort a landing if you see that it's just no way that you're going to be able to continue to keep that five meter 15 feet you should be prepared to abort that landing and really take into account which landing sites you are going to use um, we know, we know again that this is going to be really challenging for some folks, um, and that's why it's so important for you to have those other options in the back of your mind, to have those other activities, and to to really get the guests on board of what we're all trying to do with these protocols. Um, what is the end game? What is the why? Um, and making sure they understand that. So when you do have to make those tough calls, that it will cause less dissatisfaction. We all know there'll be that one or two guests uh, who, who may be dissatisfied, but it will cause less dissatisfaction because um, we're all in that together. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Lisa. Well, we've overrun, so I think it's time for us to call it a day on this summit. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all the panelists for bringing so much expertise and knowledge and for your willingness to share it with all of us. And I hope this uh, results in people making uh, good decisions out in the field this season and uh, having a successful season. Uh, from myself and on behalf of the board of PTGA, I'd like to say good luck to everyone. And I'd like to invite our president, Graham Charles, to give us a few closing words. Thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks, Lauren, in the background, as always. I'm always encouraged by these, um, you know, collaborative efforts uh, from uh, the trade association and then from within the guide, guide community. We'd love to have everybody on here, obviously, to be able to have their say. Um, but thanks to our panelists for their contributions. And I, I think just developing this, this sort of community spirit that while even within these panelists, people work for different companies, uh, but the bottom line is our care and concern for the environment and the places we go to visit in the North and South and this particular forum, Antarctica, um, and, and our uh, willingness to share and be part of a guiding community because, because that's what we are. And I think, I think, it's fantastic the way you know we have developed over the last you know five to seven years or so uh, in this in this respect. Uh, as a final thing, all I can say really is you know we had we had some big events last year in terms of safety, as Will said. Uh, that was a very that's a very bottom line uh, issue to to deal with and to be aware of. And all I can say in closing is. Please be aware, constant vigilance. I can't say enough when I run sessions on situational awareness. And besides constant vigilance, um, interpreting what you're seeing. And if you're having trouble interpreting it and trying to decide what could happen next with this particular scene, then lean on your more experienced colleagues in your team and learn yourself and or get them to give you some input because maybe that might just sharing your concern within your team or with another colleague that might lead you to action, which may nip it in the bud and that these things won't go to a worst case scenario. So 
please be safe, folks. Be your best guide and uh, have a great season. And we really look forward to getting out the other end of this one with no avian flu incidents and no major incidents on behalf of, um, of our guests. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you to our panelists and to Lauren in the background. I'm going to be very cheeky as the moderator to give some final words of my own, which is to say it has the potential to be a very challenging season and it's going to be hard to make decisions sometimes. And so a core value of mine that I recommend everyone to think about is integrity. If we always act with integrity, even though it might lead to a difficult decision in the moment, it will always lead to the right decision in the long term. So well, let's all act with integrity out there and have a great season. Thank you. Bye.